the President's press conference from the State Department Auditorium in Washington, D.C., April 18, 1962. Thank you. I have several announcements to make. The United States has today tabled at Geneva an outline of basic provisions of a treaty on general and complete disarmament in a peaceful world. It provides a blueprint of our position on general and complete disarmament, as well as elaboration of the nature, sequence, and timing of specific disarmament measures. This outline of a treaty represents the most comprehensive and specific series of proposals the United States or any other country has ever made on disarmament. In addition to stating the objectives and principles which should govern agreements for disarmament, the document calls for the grouping of individual measures in three balanced and safeguarded stages. We are hopeful that through the give and take of the conference table, this plan will have a constructive influence upon the negotiations now in progress. I want to stress that with this plan, the United States is making a major effort to achieve a breakthrough on disarmament negotiations. We believe that the nations represented at Geneva have a heavy responsibility to lay the foundations for a genuinely secure and peaceful world through starting through a reduction in arms. Secondly, I believe it would be appropriate to say a few words to follow up last week's events concerning steel prices. First, let me make it clear that this administration harbors no ill will against any individual, any industry, corporation, or segment of the American economy. Our goals of economic growth and price stability are dependent upon the success of both corporations, business, and labor. And there can be no room on either side in this country at this time for any feelings of hostility or vindictiveness. When a mistake has been retracted and the public interest preserved, Nothing is to be gained from further public recriminations. Secondly, while our chief concern last week was to prevent an inflationary spiral, we were not then and are not now unmindful of the steel industry's needs for profits, modernization, and investment capital. I believe, in fact, that this administration and the leaders of steel and other American industries are in basic agreement on far more objectives than we are in disagreement. We agree on the necessity of increased investment in modern plant and equipment. We agree on the necessity of improving our industry's ability to compete with the products of other nations. We agree on the necessity of achieving an economic cover recovery and growth that will make the fullest possible use of idle capacity. We agree on the necessity of preventing an inflationary spiral that will lead to harmful restrictions on credit and consumption. And we agree on the necessity of preserving the nation's confidence in free, private, collective bargaining and price decisions, holding the role of government to the minimum level needed to protect the public interest. In the pursuit of these objectives, we have fostered a responsible wage policy aimed at holding increases within the confines of productivity gains. We've encouraged monetary policies aimed at making borrowed capital available at reasonable cost preparing a new transportation policy aimed at providing increased freedom of competition at lower cost, proposed a new trade expansion bill to gain for our industries increased access to foreign markets, proposed an 8% income tax credit to reward investment in new equipment and machinery, and proceeded to modernize administratively the Treasury Department's guidelines on the depreciable lives of capital assets and finally taken a host of other legislative and administrative actions to foster the kind of economic recovery which will improve both profits and in incentives to invest. I believe that the anticipated profits this year for industry in general, and steel in particular, indicate that these policies are meeting with some measure of success. And it is a fact that the last quarter of last year, and I think the first quarter of this year, will be the highest profits in the history of this country and uh, the highest uh, number of people working and uh, uh, the uh, highest uh, productivity. So that while there are serious economic problems facing uh, us, nevertheless, uh, I believe that uh, progress is being made and can be made and must be made in the future. Third, the vast majority of the statement on our reservists have responded to the call of service in accordance with our best tradition. Unfortunately, the widespread publicity given to the complaints of a small minority 
have subjected many of these men to unaccustomed pressures. Upon learning that a private first class, first class faced a court-martial for writing a letter critical of my actions, I contacted the Secretary of the Army, who has the difficult task of maintaining proper discipline, and he agreed with me that such offenses are more misguided than criminal in attempt. Therefore, I've asked the Army to cancel the trial of PFC Larry B. Chidester at Fort Lewis, Washington, and in the same spirit of the Easter week, I have directed the Army to remit the balance of the Senate of Private First Class Bernice G. Owen at Fort Polk, Louisiana. Next, we are releasing today the report submitted by the Presidential Commission on Campaign Costs. I want to express my profound gratitude to this group made up of very experienced men representing those who've been active as students and as participants in the political process, fundraisers in both parties, who've come forward with the unanimous report. It's now being examined by the administration and will be the basis of legislative recommendations sent to the Congress, which I think can provide a significant advancement of the public interest in this very vital field. And lastly, I'm happy to announce that Mrs. Eisenhower has agreed to serve as honorary co-chairman with Mrs. Kennedy of the National Cultural Center. The National Cultural Center, begun in the administration of President Eisenhower, is the most significant cultural undertaking in the history of Washington and has enormous importance to the cultural life of our nation as a whole. I'm gratified that Mrs. Eisenhower will be part of this undertaking, which we hope to bring to success in uh, the coming uh, months. Mr. Yes. Uh, how does the uh, change in the situation between last week and this affect the grand jury investigation in New York? There have been reports that will be soft-pedaled, but uh, are these true, or are the potential monopoly aspects still such to uh, warrant pressing the investigation? Well, the uh, grand jury has been called in order to investigate a possible violation of the law, and uh, this is a matter now before the grand jury, and of course, uh, in accordance with the uh, procedures provided, this uh, matter will be brought to a uh, uh, continue and uh, to see if uh, such a violation occurred. Mr. President, yes. uh, does there remain <clears throat> any considerable doubt on your part as to the necessity for resuming atmospheric testing shortly? And if and when you do resume testing, do you intend to announce it in advance? Well, I think the situation is the same as it was on March 2nd. The United States uh, desires to achieve a, a responsible uh, agreement uh, on, uh, to prevent uh, future tests, providing for an effective inspection system. We uh, stand ready uh, uh, now to uh, conclude that test. The response we received uh, that uh, Prime Minister McMillan received to his uh, letter last week would indicate that the chances of securing that agreement uh, now for an effective inspection have... Uh, uh, seem to be uh, very negative, and uh, if we do not uh, uh, get that uh, agreement, then of course we uh, shall proceed, as I stated on March 2nd. In regard to any announcements that will be made, uh, they will be appropriately made at the time. Mr. President, President. Yes. <coughs> Mr. President, there are reports that some of your top military advisors are urging the United States to help France with the development of its nuclear striking force. Uh, have you given this problem any consideration, and what do you think about it, sir? Well, I think that the uh, policy of the United States, uh, of course, uh, continues to be uh, that of uh, being uh, very reluctant to see the proliferation of uh, nuclear weapons. We are attempting to, uh, in our disarmament uh, offers that we made, that uh, we are attempting, and in my speech, Last September, before the United Nations, I said that I thought it would be regrettable if nuclear weapons proliferate, proliferated or spread, <laughs> and uh, uh, the uh, so that our policy continues on uh, uh, on that uh, basis and will continue unless uh, we feel that uh, security requirements uh, suggest a change. Mr. President, uh, Mr. President, uh, uh, there's been considerable uh, speculation that. Uh, uh, the victory you have won uh, uh, in the steel situation uh, will uh, be of uh, great assistance uh, uh, for the passage of your legislative program in Congress. Would you care to comment on that, sir? Well, I hope it's of assistance in passing the uh, tax uh, credit, uh, which is uh, intended to provide, uh, combined with price stability, a means to, for our uh, industry to uh, modernize itself and, in fact, to encourage it. I'm hopeful, in my opinion, if the... Uh, rise in prices are permitted to stand, it would have been extremely difficult to secure the passage of this legislation. I think that the line has been held uh, 
provides a much better atmosphere, and I think that if this legislation is passed, it will materially help the steel companies and industry in general, and I'm uh, very uh, strongly in support of it. As far as the rest of the program, I think that uh, that part of the program which is involved with the economy, I think, will be helped by the fact that uh, we've been able to maintain at this time a uh, stable price level. Mr. President, yes. uh, you said several weeks ago that you would take another look to see if you should request a supplemental appropriation this year to revive the Federal Flood Insurance Act of 1956. Have you reached any decision there on is, that? There is a, a meeting, as you know, of uh, some of the governors who are involved. Uh, uh, there, it's either uh, has been uh, in the last few hours or it's today, and uh, they're meeting with some of our government officials. This is one of the matters which are being considered uh, by the governors and by the federal government. Yes. Uh, and Mr. Rockefeller told me uh, last night that he thought it was terrible that service wives, of uh, which his daughter Mary is one, uh, cannot join their service husbands abroad. Uh, so now we have not only gold and lonely hearts, but also politics injected into this situation. And I'm wondering if now that steel prices aren't going up, uh, the ban on service couples uh, getting together might be lifted. It's been more than seven months. Now. Yes, I understand. And I think I attempted uh, last press conference to respond to the question. I, I stated we have a very serious problem uh, involved in, in gold that... Uh, as I said last time, we are asking the Secretary of Defense to reduce our overseas expenditures by a billion dollars, and the responsibility falls very heavily upon him and upon all of us. We do not desire, obviously, it's against our national social interest to uh, separate these families, and we're, uh, we have done it to the extent that we have done it only because of a very serious uh, crisis. Now, we, that crisis, uh, at least that situation in regard to gold continues, and Secretary McNamara is continuing to analyze the best way to provide for the saving of a billion dollars. Yes, I realize that, and I know that the gold situation is very serious, and I am wondering if you have directed uh, Secretary Dillon to look into <coughs> the serious situation of uh, American uh, companies setting up plants abroad so often to escape American tax dollars or to take advantage of the cheaper labor abroad. Uh, uh, as you uh, know, in the bill which passed the House of Representatives, there is a section which deals with the problem of companies established abo abroad in order to evade taxes, and that's a matter now before the Senate. And it is an attempt to discourage that drain on, our, the, on the dollar and gold by uh, tax policies. And so we are attempting to meet it in a whole variety of ways. Yes. Two questions in the wake of last week's developments. First. Uh, assuming that a price increase in steel would eventually be necessary and justified, do you have any thoughts as to how this price increase should be reached? And secondly, if some major labor union uh, made excessive demands for wage increases, uh, would you move as sharply against that union as you did last week? Well, to take the second part first, we had uh, worked very uh, closely with the... Uh, steel union in an attempt to uh, persuade them that it was in their interest and the country's interest to meet the standards set by the Council of Economic Advisers. And uh, it was done. And that is why this matter came into particularly sharp focus last week. Now, as far as the first part, uh, I think that my original statement discussed our general views on it. These, this is a free economy. They can, these matters are reached uh, by the process of competition and collective bargaining. What we are attempting to do is to try to have them consider the public interest, which after all is their interest, the problems involving uh, price stability, national security, and all the rest, they're very much interrelated. And this is particularly true in the basic industries. But the, uh, our power is that uh, if, if, there's, if the industry is competitive, Prices are reached uh, through the normal process of competition, and the collective bargaining agreements are reached in the normal way. But we would like both labor and management to be very conscious of the public stake at this time, and that's what we're attempting to bring forth. We hope they'll Mr. President, I ask the first question specifically because the Wall Street Journal <coughs> and some other spokesmen of business have accused you directly of having set the price in steel. Well, uh... I'm aware of the accusations. Uh, what we attempted to do was project before the steel companies the public interest. And uh, it was a combination of the public interest uh, placed upon the table in front of them and uh, competition, which I think brought the uh, price down. 
by the fact that uh, several companies refused to increase prices and therefore competition uh, worked its will. We want to be sure that competition is uh, an active force in our economy. But I would, uh, not, uh, I would not accept the uh, view of the Wall Street Journal in regard to uh, at least my uh, feeling of a description of my actions or of the public interest. President. Chairman Miller and other Republican leaders have focused a good deal of criticism on the nocturnal activities of the FBI. Could you shed any light on us, sir? No, they were attempting to, uh, reporters have called up a good many people in the middle of the night themselves. And, uh, I, uh, all we were attempting to do was to find out so that we could decide about the grand jury meeting whether the reports in regard to the uh, quotations, which said one thing, and then there was a, a statement that they were misquoted, and then the next day there was a clarification. We wanted to get the facts on this. Now, both the reporters were very cooperative. I didn't realize they would be woken up at the time they were. The decision was made at an earlier time in the evening. And I suppose making the connection, uh, the FBI uh, uh, followed uh, ahead. And, I, and uh, as I say, all the reporters except that of the Wall Street Journal most cooperative. Now, uh, the... Uh, <laughs> But I, I don't, the intention was not to disturb the reporters. The intention was to get the information as quickly as possible so we could determine what action we would take before the grand jury. And uh, uh, as always, the FBI uh, carried out its uh, responsibilities immediately. Mr. President, yeah. Mr. President, would you care to comment on developments in New Orleans where the Archbishop excommunicated three people for hindering school desegregation? Well, the action of the Archbishop related to... Uh, private acts in uh, the uh, of private individuals and did not involve public acts or public policies so that uh, carrying out the spirit of the Constitution which provides a separation between uh, church and state, I think it would be inappropriate for me to comment on uh, this matter. Mr. President, yeah. Mr. President uh, last week you stated that the administration had not asked for assurances from the steel industry that prices would be kept where they were when the contracts were ratified. <coughs> Uh, I wonder if you can tell us whether you received such assurances, either directly or indirectly, and I'm prompted to ask because the day the contracts were ratified, you stated that the settlement was non-inflationary. That's correct. That's correct. I, I think we responded to this last week when I stated that I did not ask uh, for the reasons which I gave the steel companies for uh, uh, the, uh, to give a commitment that they would not increase prices. But I stated at the time that it was uh, very clear that our whole effort was to secure a non-inflationary uh, settlement. Well, my question, Mr. President, was directed at whether such assurances were given to you. Regardless no, I said at the last week that I said they were not. If you read the last week's uh, interview, you say that they were not asked and they were not given. I'm not given. That's, my That's question. correct. On the other hand, on the other hand, uh, during the conversations which were held, it was made very clear the purpose of our attempting to persuade the steel union not to accept an inflationary settlement. And no statement was made during any of those conversations that a price increase would immediately follow the wage accord, particularly if that wage accord were non-inflationary. So that while no request were, was made for a commitment, on the other hand, no statement was made which would have indicated to us that if the union cooperated and accepted a very low increase, that on the other hand, there would then still be an automatic price increase. Mr. President, Mr. President, yes. Mr. President you agree that it's important for the steel companies to modernize their plants. Does the government have any uh, ideas about helping steel to do this? That is aside from the 8% uh, tax credit. And also the rewriting of Schedule F, the depreciation allowances, and already a study has been on for some weeks. We've already done that in the textile industry, and we are now analyzing uh, steel and certain other basic industries in order to uh, improve their depreciation position. So the secondly, I do want to say that in regard to profits, that uh, the last quarter, and as I said, the first quarter, the highest profits in the history of the United States, and uh, uh, therefore I feel that uh, while some particular companies in some industries may have special problems, that the overall profit situation is not unsatisfactory. Mr. President, Sir, yeah. Mr. President. Yes, Ms. Levy. Uh, uh, Mr. Soroskin, Soviet delegate to the disarmament conference at Geneva, told representatives of the Women's <coughs> Right for Peace that Russia would negotiate a nuclear test ban treaty with the United States if the United States would close down just one of its missile bases overseas as a gesture of good faith. When the women reported this to Ambassador Dean, he suggested they refer the proposal to you. Would you give us your view? Well, I've never heard that proposal made by the Soviet Union. In other words, they would agree, uh, as it suggested. Uh, uh, well, now, uh, I don't think you can read the letter of the 
chairman to a prime minister and get that impression. There's no, uh, we have never heard that they would agree uh, to a, uh, an effective test ban, uh, an inspection system, if we would close down one base, and my judgment is there's no evidence for believing that they would. Well, this they told us to well, these private uh, people. Well, now, they're at the conference uh, at uh, Geneva, and I'm sure that if there's, uh, Mr. Dean would be glad to ask if the, that is so, but uh, my judgment would be based on all the conversations which have gone on for many weeks, and in fact, the three years of negotiations, uh, there's one, uh, 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 there is no evidence that they would do this. It's a lot different from saying we'll agree to negotiate about it if such an action is taken. They are now negotiating about it. We've been negotiating about it for three years. We were negotiating about it last August when they began testing. So I think that, uh, it indicates the long gap, as I said before, between an agreement to negotiate and negotiated agreement. Mr. Right. Sir, yeah. I would like to ask you if the reports from Geneva on the radio this morning about the U.S. Uh, disarmament proposal are correct. And that is that the U.S. proposes to scrap all armies and weapons and have a U.N. police force. I could not find out if this was the draft because the drafts have not been made public to the American people or to all members of Congress yet. Yes, they're being made public uh, today, uh, uh, Ms. McLennan, and the description you've given is not an accurate one of our proposal. It's not, an uh, not, a, not an accurate one of our proposal. Would you tell us what it is? Well, Ms. McClendon, uh, the treaty will be made available to the members of the press today and will describe the various stages upon which we propose uh, that disarmament might be taken, what uh, actions we will take during these various stages, what protections are given to the security of the United States. And I think that uh, when you have read the entire treaty, you will realize that uh, my response, uh, uh, that the description you have given is not, uh, at least, is not uh, comprehensive. Mr. President, yeah. uh, over the weekend, as you know, there's been uh, somewhat of a flat over some proposals which uh, the United States might make to the Soviets on Berlin. Could you tell us in this connection, sir, whether you would think it desirable to give the East Germans a technical voice in uh, any international authority which might control access to West Berlin, provided it is part of uh, an arrangement uh, which guarantees our existing rights. Well, I would have to examine uh, that uh, language again that you've just submitted to me. Uh, the question really is the status, the position, the authority of the uh, East uh, German uh, regime in regard to any uh, access authority. That really is one of the, that has been a basic issue since these discussions started, so that I could not uh, attempt to respond to your question unless we had definitions of the Technical Commission, its powers, the status of the East German regime in that authority, whether, that, uh, whether they had the authority or whether it was held by the four powers, what were the means by which the four powers exercised uh, their rights. These are all the questions which are the subjects of negotiations between the Soviet Union and ourselves. This matter, however, certainly is one of the points which are now under discussion with the Soviet Union, how we can uh, uh, reconcile the uh, problem of uh, access and uh, uh, maintain our position there. And, uh, but I think, as the Department of State has said, the uh, government in West Germany has been kept informed and uh, there are no propo the proposals that we have talked about, the four that we're talking about now, are in the general channel of previous proposals that have been discussed with the Soviet Union. Uh, some of your critics uh, feel that uh, you set prices or have been uh, gone into the field of price control by executive fiat in the steel situation, and further, that uh, this sets a precedent which you would have to follow in future situations. You feel that you have set a precedent that as these situations arise, you would again have to invoke this sort of power? I think the uh, steel, uh, I've stated, I, I think, in our statement, what I believe to be the general policy of this administration in regard to prices and wages. Everyone is quite aware of what the powers are of the government and, their, and the limitation of those powers. Uh, and what the presumptions are, that collective bargaining will be free and that the, the competitive system, the competition within industry, will maintain prices at a reasonable level. I've attempted to... Uh, state the uh, public interest involved in all these negotiations and we will have to try to continue as we have in the past to bring these matters before the uh, labor and management in an attempt to provide the kinds of agreement which will maintain price stability we're going to attempt to do that but i have not suggested that our power that we have powers to set or that those powers would be desirable to set 
prices or to set uh, wages. But we can attempt, it seems to me, to bring before the parties in the most effective way possible the public interest that is involved and must be involved, particularly in these basic industries, when uh, competition, our balance of payments, all involve our national security and our military forces abroad. The interrelationship makes the public interest mandatory in these matters, and it's our responsibility to bring it to those that are involved, which is what we try to do in steel. In that connection, Mr. President, the uh, next major round of negotiations appear to be with the aerospace and missile aircraft industry, uh, with the two unions, the machinists and the auto workers, already asserting that they want wage increases considerably above the formula laid down by the Council of Economic Advisors. And they point out that the government is really a, a major party to these negotiations since they have the contracts. Would you uh, assert the public interest in these negotiations? I think the public interest is very definitely involved, but I, in asserting the public interest, uh, we have always uh, recognized the uh, proper limitations of, that, uh, of the power of the government to enforce any collective bargaining agreement. We do not have that power. That power has not been given to us, but we will certainly attempt to describe to the people involved, particularly in a program which is so important to the national security, we will attempt to describe the public interest, which after all is their interest as well as uh, that of the nation. Now, whether these parties will be responsive as the steel union was and as f on Friday the steel companies were, of course, is a matter that uh, will be seen in the future. Following up Mr. Scully's question on Berlin, sir, our negotiations with the Russians have been carried out in behalf of the other occupying powers as well. In view of the flurry he referred to over the weekend and in view of the definite French reservations, would you tell us a little bit about how we stand as, in effect, the spokesman for the four powers at this moment? Well, I think that uh, Mr. Uh, a, uh, I think von Eckhart, uh, speaking for the West Germans, uh, made uh, a statement that uh, they had been in consultation with us and that uh, they had confidence in our efforts. Uh, the French have had reservations in the begin from the beginning in regard to these probes, feeling, and uh, we are continuing these probes in order to determine whether there's an effective basis for uh, high negotiations, and we shall continue. The United States, uh, this is a very dangerous area involving vital interests of both sides, which could, uh, even though at this present time the temperature has been lowered, uh, could blow up any time, and I don't think that we are meeting our responsibilities to our own people uh, if we do not take every effort, in addition to strengthening ourselves militarily and indicating a determination to protect our vital interests, to see if an accord can be reached. Because we, obviously it would be in the international interest if this particular area, which is so susceptible to pressure because of its geographical position, uh, could be, uh, a, an agreement could be reached. So we're going to continue to do it. Now, before any agreement is finally signed, if we ever get that far, of course, the uh, French and the British and the West Germans would all uh, be uh, very much participants. But the stage we're at now is to see whether such an agreement can be reached. Can we take it, sir, that as of this moment, the West Germans, as the party most directly affected, support these proposals that we are putting together? I think that the West Germans are, uh, uh, should really speak uh, for themselves, but I have no reason to believe that the West German government does not... Uh, support the efforts we are making to determine whether an accord can be reached. But as far as their own uh, position on each particular matter, I think they would, should state that. Uh, Mr. President, in view of what you have, I'm sorry. Yes. In view of what you have called the very negative prospect for obtaining an effective nuclear test ban agreement with Russia, have you now set a specific date for the United States to resume testing in the atmosphere? I think that uh, the time was described in the uh, March uh, 2nd speech. Mr. President, there's been a good deal said recently, and I think you have addressed yourself to the fact that... But in answer to your question, there's not a specific day been set now. That uh, the laborers' gain should be tied to productivity and that their wage increases would be. That's correct. Uh, not much has been said as to whether the investor should also share in this productivity. Uh, and apparently they didn't in the uh, in the recent steel negotiations. Oh, the productivity. The uh, no, the the owners of steel st stocks have shared very uh, much in uh, the uh, last uh, ten years. Uh, I don't think there's any question. I think there's been a split of uh, six t times in the United States steel stocks since '48, '49, and they've been paid a very uh, a good dividend, and uh, they have very strong equity. And uh, what is true of U.S. Steel is true even in greater extent in other steel companies and, as I've said, in industry in general. So that uh, uh, I think the shareholders uh, 
and the shareholders will do very well. For example, if uh, what one of the problems is is to increase the cost of steel at a time when you're only using uh, 60 or 65 or 70 percent of your capacity, if you could, uh, there would have been perhaps about a 260 or 70 million dollar <coughs> present capacity increase in uh, profits of the steel companies. But if you could get uh, the uh, capacity of steel up to 85 or 90 percent, you would have had a you would have a 500 million dollar increase in their profits at present prices. So the real problem in the steel industry is unused capacity. But in answer to your question, uh, the shareholders have participated in increased uh, productivity. Thank you.